Amen. Good morning, church. It's indeed a wonderful day as we come together and worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Do you want more of Jesus? Of course. Of course, it wouldn't be. All right. More. More about Jesus. Okay. Question. Why do people want to change? Why do people want to change? And why do people don't want to change? That's my question to all of us. Now, here's a general principle. General principle. People want to change because they are not satisfied with their situation. That's number one. On the other hand, people don't want to change because they are satisfied already with their situations. Am I correct or am I correct? Now, remember last time we, we talked about change or choice. Sorry, we talked about choice and we said that uh, in choice there are uh, uh, options. Normally, two options. And one is better than the other. If one is better, the other is better. Okay. Now, those who want change, they see something better. Okay. They see something better from, from this option. So that's why they choose that option. Now, if you do not start making choices, your life will be no different from what they are now. Right? Now, nothing will happen to your life if you will not make that choice. So this morning, we will talk about choice again. But this time, we will talk about change starts with a choice. Change always starts with a choice. Okay. Now, when you see something better out there, now that you wish or dream that you can also have or you can also be, there is an automatic uh, inclination or a screening in our mind that says, what am I going to do? Will I do something or will I just sit down here and do nothing? Or stand up and do something about it if you want to have change. Right? You are faced with so many choices. Okay? Again, as we said, Normally, in, in choice, there are two options. Now, last time I said that uh, one good thing about our creation is that we are created by God with free will. We are created by God with free will, and that's wonderful because you, you can choose whatever you want. We are not a robot, okay, robots. Okay. We are gifted with the, by God with the ability to think, with the ability to reason, and with the ability to choose whatever we want. And that is what differentiates us from the animals. Okay? If you will see that, you will appreciate the creation of God in you. Because you have that ability to think. You have that ability to reason. You have that ability to choose. While animals, they don't have that. Okay? They have what, they call, what we call instinct. We can reason out. Animals, they don't. Okay? We can make moral choices. Animals, they don't do that. They are governed by the law of what we call the survival of the fittest. Okay? Now, given now, we also discussed the last time I stood before you, we talked about uh, information-based decision-making. Now, given with the information-based decision-making, we can now make logical and intellectual choice based on our values-based decision-making. Now, the question again is that we must still answer is this. But why do I need to make a choice? Why do you need to make a choice? You have to answer that, uh, my dear brethren and friends. Now, the answer to that is because of change. The reason why I need to make a choice, a choice is because of this word, 
change. Hopefully for the best and not for the worst. Okay. Now, in most important, uh, in the most important part of our decisions in life, choice and change, they can go together. And they go together. Okay. Change is what motivates us to choose. The reason why you change. Okay. The reason why you choose because of change, and that's what, what motivates us to choose. And therefore, change is the byproduct of our choice, the byproduct of your choices, whether the results be a blessings or the results be a negative consequence, right? So, the first area we need to change is to change our life, to choose to change our life. Okay? And the way we choose to change our life is we start up here. Up here. We need to start changing, choosing to change our mind. Okay? Now, because all the decisions are actually coming from here with our minds. Okay? It is processed in our minds. Now, I think you know the story about the elephant tied uh, in a uh, little stick. Okay. Now the story, the elephant was tied to a little stick, a little, little peg okay, with a rope. When the elephant was small, the owner used just, a, uh, just enough uh, rope so that to keep the animals from going stray or from breaking loose. So he tied the elephant with the rope and he tied it on the peg. Now as the elephant grew, and as the elephant tried to escape, you know, he wasn't able to escape because he was tied. Now, for, the, for so many times that the elephant tried to escape, as he grew older, of course, he grew bigger, and uh, he never tried escaping anymore because in his mind, he could never escape. Because when he was young, he tried escaping, but he could not do it. And his mindset was focused that he could never escape because his, his uh, foot was tied with a rope and on that little peg. Until he grew up, he never tried escaping. And then one time, one time, the son of the father who owns the elephant, he was so curious. How come the elephant didn't try to escape? He could easily snap the nut. And he could easily, you know, pull the peg out because he was so big. You know why? Because of mindset. Mindset. Okay. The power of the mind. Whatever you think, you will become. One time, I shared a message about the power of the mind back home. And one of the brother, he tried it to prove if I am wrong, if I'm right. I told them, when you think, you will become. And he tried proving me wrong. And uh, after the service, he tried thinking, I will be sick, I will be sick, I will be sick, I will be sick. For three days, he was thinking, I will be sick, I will be sick. On the fourth day, he got sick. And the following week, he came up to me. <clears throat> and he told me, Brother Mike, you are right. What do you mean I am right? Last week when you said, what do you think you'll become? So, for three days, I kept on thinking I will be sick. On the fourth day, I was sick. The power of the mind. The power of the mind. You see, just like the elephant. His mindset was, I cannot escape. See, the power of our mindset, our beliefs, our biases and values to control your life. Number one, change the way. <laughs> change the way you think. <laughs> I need again to replace my keyboard. I need to buy a, a more expensive keyboard. So that's change the way you think. Just put the letter K. <laughs> you see, the power of the mind. <laughs> Choose the way, change the way you think. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Now, in this verse, we are given choices. It says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. 
Okay, don't copy or don't conform. Okay, uh, in other translation. So there's a choice. Either you copy or you don't copy. Okay. And this was a command from Apostle Paul, uh, giving us choice okay, for all of us to choose not to copy or to copy the pattern of this world. Right? Now, again, it says there, but let God transform you. But let God transform you. Again, we are presented with a choice. Either we let God transform us or we let the sat- or we let Satan transform you and rule you. A choice. Now, Apostle Paul immediately gave his uh, choice for us to choose. And, um, and that is to let God transform you into what? He says, into a new person. New person. What does that mean? It means change. Lord, our Lord God in heaven wants to change you. Okay? God wants to change me. Now, I want you to take note of this, and you can even write this down. God wants to change me. For this to happen, I need to choose to change the way I think. If my mindset is on thinking worldly things, things that pleases the devil, then I cannot be transformed by God. Remember that. You cannot be transformed by God if you let the devil control your mind. God cannot transform you into the best person that you could possibly be. For the Bible said, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. For indeed, it cannot. If we keep on feeding our minds with things that are unhealthy, you know, to us, to our relationship with God, then God cannot transform us. Then God cannot transform you. The only way God can transform us is by allowing Him, by allowing Him through what the Bible said in Romans 12, to the renewing of our minds, changing the way you think. But the question is, how do we think in the first place? How do we think, how people think in the first place? In, in general, what keeps us preoccupied? The Bible tells us in Colossians 1.21, this is how we think. This includes you who were once apart, uh, far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and by your evil actions. You see, God wants us to change. God wants to transform you because this is how the way we think. Because this is how the way we act. By your evil thoughts and by actions. See, Our minds are bent into evil thoughts. And it is manifested by our actions. The saying is true. Where the mind goes, the body will follow. Right? Now, God wouldn't have us transform if our minds were already surrendered to Him. Correct? Now, by letting go of evil thoughts from our being, we are letting God take control and make a stronghold in our life. Now, Romans 12, 2, uh, 12, uh, chapter 12, verse 2 tells us by the renewing of our mind. The question is, what does that mean? What does renewing of the mind mean? Renewing of the mind is the biblical concept of changing our values and beliefs, our ways and thoughts to be aligned with God. You must align your thoughts, your ways with that of God. And that God wants us to, to take control of the way we think. Because God wants to transform you. And that's what the meaning of renewing of the mind. Okay. Isaiah 55 verse 7 tells us, Let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of wrongdoing. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to our God for he will forgive generously. You see, by banishing the very thought of evil 
and forsaking its ways, we are aligning ourselves with that of God. We are turning ourselves to the Lord. Colossians 1 again tells us that our minds, our thoughts were bent on evil ways and our actions follow suit. Until we learn to control, to change the way we think, God cannot transform me. By renewing of the mind, God's way will be my way and God's thought will be my way of thinking. Aligning myself with God. Now the next question is, what would God transform us into? Now remember, God would like to transform you. Transform us, transform me into what? Okay. Transform us into robots? I don't think so. Transform us into billionaires? Or probably transform me into looking like Tom Cruise? Or Tom Jones? <laughs> or probably Brad Pitt? No. Maybe he will transform me into Brad Pitt or armpit <laughs> but it says in Romans chapter 12 verse 2 God wants to transform us into a new person okay? but what does a new person look like a new person look like oh, Isaiah 55 verse 8 my thoughts are not your thoughts neither are your ways my ways declares the Lord in Ephesians chapter 4, our scripture reading, this is what God wants to transform each and every one of you. Ephesians chapter 4. And that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man, which was created according to God, in what? In true righteousness and holiness. You see, we throw our former conduct of life, our old men, our old sinful ways, our old self, and be renewed with a new man. Be renewed with the spirit of the mind, the renewing of the mind. And God wants you to put on that new self of yours because you have accepted the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ into your life. And to be like God in what? In all righteousness and in all holiness. So therefore, a new person is living a Christ-centered life that is righteous and holy. If you are not living a Christ-centered life, and if you are not living a righteous and a holy individual, then you have not truly been transformed by God. Because a transformed Man by God, he will live a righteous living that is holy and which has his Christ as the center of his life. And that is what a new person is. Now here's another thing that God wants to transform us into. Are you ready? God will transform you into this. Philippians chapter 3 verse 21. Who by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. The ultimate transformation that God wants to do to you, to do to me, is to transform these lowly bodies of ours, these corruptible bodies of ours, to immortality, so that we can go where God is. And that is in heaven. So we can enter heaven. In short, we are being transformed for salvation. Salvation is what God is transforming us for if we choose to change the way we think. Number two, change how you feed your mind. Choose the way, change the way you think and change how you feed your mind. Now, will you agree with me if I tell you the fiercest battle you will ever face is not out there, but in your mind. That is where the battle is, in our mind. It was said the toughest battle you'll ever fight is the battle within yourself. 
Some of the greatest battles will be fought within the silent chambers of your soul. If the greatest battle is within us, therefore, our greatest achievement is to win that battle within ourselves. If you conquer that battle within yourself, then you have achieved your greatest achievement. Okay. But we must know first how to feed our mind. We must know how to win the battle. Okay. Now, Paul long ago already observed and said that in our mind, there is the fiercest battle. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 4, he said, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 4. Now let me concentrate on the word strongholds. Okay. What is stronghold? It is what people go to and depend on for safety. Any coverings, any walls or forts that act as a shelter from harm. The purpose of the stronghold is for others not to get to you to harm you. And that is what the stronghold is. A spiritual stronghold is this. In a spiritual battle, the strongholds are our distorted thinkings, our bias, our beliefs, our pretensions, our sentiments, our grudges, our fears, and our justifications that are set up against the ways and thoughts of God. Now, we run to these strongholds of ours because we don't want to be influenced by the truth because we believe that our strongholds are the truth and it will keep us from danger. But of course, we are wrong. We are wrong if we keep on running towards our own strongholds. Now, the Bible said we demolish. We demolish strongholds not by using the weapons of this world, but by the weapons that is made available to us by God, and that is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 7. It is the only, it is only by the Word of God that we can demolish all those strongholds that we keep in us, that take us captive. You know, we use the word of God to demolish those strongholds and take them captive to obey Christ. And the only way to wield and the only way to sharpen our sword, okay, our sword is by remembering these three L's. This is how we wield or sharpen our sword. Three L's. We listen Listening, we listen to God's word, we read God's word, and we learn. We study. We not only listen, but you'll try to learn, to comprehend what's being said. And then you live by the word. Those three, the three L's, we listen, we learn, and we live. Those three are the things that we do to sharpen and to wield the sword that we're going to use to demolish those strongholds. Now, if we don't, if we don't do these things, then it cannot cut through. It won't cut through. Now, the reason we have these strongholds is because we feed ourselves with them. And as we feed ourselves with it, we are actually nurturing them. All right? And as we nurture them, we are letting those things grow in us to mature in us and take root in us so we are now rooted in our own strongholds and now we cannot escape from our own strongholds because we nurture them we feed them every day so therefore we must we must not be surprised my dear brethren and friends if we cannot change or even find it hard to change because we fortified we put walls we fortified ourselves with these kinds of strongholds. So that is why we are so miserable. 
And that is why there's so much anxiety in us. There's so much problem in us because we nurture, we feed ourselves with all of these negative things and we fortified ourselves with them. I remember when I had my own uh, battle of anxiety way, way back, I always ran to my strongholds, my fears, and my, my pretensions. Okay? Now, the only way I escaped my own strongholds was through the Word of God. I'm telling you, through the Word of God. That's how I escaped my own strongholds. Praise be to God. You see, God and His Word is the only tool that can bring down your strongholds. You must remember those three L's that I told you. Now, how do you change the way you feed your mind? Okay. Feed yourself with the Word. Feed yourself with the Word. Enough with those negativities. Enough with, with those hatreds. Feed yourself with the Word of God. Jeremiah 15, 16. Your words were found and I ate them. And in other translations, it says, I devoured them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Now, the first time the words of God came to Jeremiah, he ate them. He devoured them. He was, you know, he, was, he, he knew whom he was talking to. And he knew it was God that was talking to him. So when he listened to God, he paid attention to God carefully. It was a joy to him. Listening to the words of God was a joy to Jeremiah. See? But if you're going to read the context of Jeremiah 15, it's not at all joyous. It's not at all uh, uh, joyful because God gave Jeremiah a horrible news. You see, of his uh, judging the people of Judah because of their backsliding and because of their mocking of God. But Jeremiah said, your words were found, I ate them, and your word was to me the joy and rejoicing. You see, Jeremiah found solace, found comfort and joy in God's word, even when he was faced with the dilemma of prophesying against the nation of Judah. The lesson is we can find joy and rejoicing in our hearts if we feed ourselves with God's word every day. In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20, My son, pay attention to my words and be willing to learn. You see, pay attention to my words. You listen. The first L, right? You listen. You listen to my words and be willing to learn. The second L, learn. Open your ears. You listen to my sayings. Do not let them escape. You live by them from your sight. Keep them. You live by the word of God in the center of your heart. For they are what? For they are life to those who find them and healing and health to all their flesh. Now, how often do we, do we hear doctors say that, you know, Brother Joe, you know, I think you need to just to pray to God for miracle. I cannot do any more to you. Pray to God for a miracle. Turn to God for healing. How many times do we hear doctors say that? How many times? You see, when they cannot do anything anymore, they want you to turn to God. Why? Because they believe in the power of God. They believe in the power of prayer. According to James, you see, prayer of the righteous is both what? Powerful. Powerful. And effective. You see? When I had my pain for three weeks, I cannot really move. When the doctors gave me a uh, pain reliever, it was so bad that I, I, I felt sick. My world is turning. And I pray to God. And after that, I didn't take the pain reliever anymore because my pain reliever is the most there is. That is God. See? You see, we pray to God because we know that God can heal you. Look at Proverbs chapter 4. For they are life. The words of God is life. And they are healing and they are held to all of their flesh. If you let your strongholds control you, if you let your fear run over you, definitely you will be crushed by your own fear. And you will be living in fear. You will be living in anger and in, in, in resentment 
all the rest of your life and you will be miserable. If you want out, if you want to be happy, read the word of God. Be with God. Gaigo or gigo, garbage in, garbage out. A concept of the quality of output is determined by the quality of input. You are what you think. If you feed anger, if you feed yourself with anger, resentment, grudges daily inside your head, you know, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised if you will look old for your age. Look at me. I am 50, but I look 30. I am 50, but I look 30. Right? Amen? <laughs> look at yourself. You are so happy. Why? Why? Because you have Christ in you. You have Christ in you. Amen to that. See, if you want to get out of this stronghold, if you want to get out of that situation, one thing that will help you is the Word of God. It is life, it is healing, and it is help. Okay. You change that from this. Okay. God in, God out. You put God in so that whatever your life will be, it will manifest God. Your lips will manifest God. A quality output of healing, health, and life determined by the quality input of God. You see, people will see the beauty of Jesus living in you. The next is surround yourself with godly people. If you have this kind of trouble, you know, surround yourself with godly people. Blessed is the man who has not walked in the counsel of the ungodly and has not stood in the way of sinners and has not sat in the seat of evil men. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. You see, those who serve time in jail, now they will tell you that they got into so much trouble because of the wrong choice of people. The wrong choice of crowd they surround themselves with. Now, according to Romans chapter 12, 21, it says, do not overcome evil, but overcome good with evil. So overcome uh, evil with good. <laughs> overcome evil with good. Okay, I got that right. Now, if you want change, if you want to be better, surround yourself with this kind of people. Now, look around you. Look around you and see those happy faces, those handsome and those beautiful faces. You surround yourself with this kind of people. You don't want to surround yourself with, you know, evil people that will only uh, destroy your life. Okay. Go to your brother. Go to your sister in Christ. Go to them. And in the event that someone comes to you, listen to them. Take time. Have time to listen to them. Sit with them. Because they needed your help. Finally, change your perspective. Now, change your perspective. Now, I remember talking to you about the two uh, salesperson, the two uh, Schumann, okay, the, the, the sales guy. Okay. Now, in the story, okay, let, me, let me tell the story again very shortly. In the story, the first shoe sales guy, um, he was asked by his boss, now, you go to this place in, in Africa, okay? in the certain, in the certain uh, uh, place there, you go there and you, you sell shoes. And uh, the number one sales guy said, okay, boss, I will go there and I will uh, sell many shoes. So he went to that place. And one week, just uh, a few days, three days after, this number one sales guy called up the boss. Hey, boss. Get me out of here. Why? I cannot sell any shoes here. Why? Because the people, they are not wearing anything. How can I sell shoes? How can I sell shoes? Right? So get me out of here. Okay. The boss said, come back. And then another salesperson, he was at the bottom okay, of the, uh, the sales force. He overheard the conversation, and he said to the boss, boss, send me. Huh? Yeah, send me. And I will uh, make you millionaire. Come on, you have nothing to lose. And the boss said, okay, 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 you go there. So he went, 
And then uh, one week had passed, the boss is worried because he had not heard from this uh, sales guy. What happened to him? Maybe he's dead. <laughs> then two weeks after, nothing. And then all of a sudden, the phone ran. Boss, and he was excited. Oh, what happened to you? The boss said, what happened to you? Are you okay? Yes, sir, I'm okay. And in fact, I will make you a millionaire. Huh? What's wrong? Oh, what's, what's happening? What's going on? Sir, you see, all of these people, they are not wearing anything. They are barefoot. Okay? Now, I will make you a millionaire because I will teach them how to wear shoes and make also slippers, sandals, because I will teach them how to wear sandals and slippers. I will be your number one sales representative in no time. And then after a month, comes the orders. You see? Perspective. Change your perspective. Now the lesson, change your perspective. Perspective comes from one experiences, beliefs, and biases. Sometimes we need to unlearn to learn. Change your perspective. By changing our perspective, we will see opportunities, not obstacles. We will see growth, not stereotypes. You see, the first salesman, what he saw was obstacle. What he saw, you know, was walls, wall, problems. But the other salesman, what he saw was opportunities. See, are we seeing opportunities in our lives? As we go out there, as we try to preach the gospel or, or share the gospel, are we seeing opportunities of somebody or talking to somebody that somebody might needed Jesus Christ? You see what, uh, was, what, what was read a while ago by Brother uh, Kennedy? Treat each one, you see, the kinder way you could possibly do or way. Because that person is also having a difficult time. You see, perspective, my dear brothers and sisters. See, you see that the, the, the two salesmen, they were in the same exact location. They were in the same exact country. They were dealing with the exact, exact same people. And they were selling the same exact product. Nothing was changed. Okay? Nothing was changed. Okay? Nothing was changed to give the other salesman an advantage over the other. But the second salesman was so successful. Okay? The only thing, now listen, the only thing that changed was his perspective. See, sometimes we only need to change our perspective, my dear brothers and sisters. It's never the situation that is at fault. It is your fault because of the way you choose to view it. See, if you will not change your perspective, if you will not change your beliefs, your biases, you will be stuck in your own self-made dungeon of misery while drowning yourself with your nonsense self-pity. That is true. That is true. You can never be a better version of your old self. And worse, you can never see the light of heaven. Oh, Brother Mike, that's a heavy word, a serious word, yes. And why did I say that? So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Paul tells us to change our perspective about those things unseen. Faith, heaven, hell, God, the Holy Spirit and even Jesus Christ. Because many believe until now Jesus Christ is just a myth, a figment, a pigment of our imagination. Change your perspective about salvation. You need to unlearn to learn. Now, brethren and friends, change starts with a choice. Be the change you want to see. Now, someone said, our life is the sum of all our choices. Everything in, a, in your life is a reflection of the choices you make. Don't expect, don't expect a different result by doing the same thing over and over again. Try making a different choice, a different approach for a different result. 
A better life is impossible without change. If you want to see the brighter side of life, choose to change. Try new things. Okay? Try new things. Although trying new things is scary, but we should try new things. But do you know what is even scarier? What is even scarier is the word regret. Regret. I should have done that. I should have chosen God when I was alive. Regret. Regret. Just like the elephant in the picture a while ago, he stopped trying. Apostle Paul said, for me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Change the way you think. Change your perspective. Do not have regrets. You know, Paul chooses to change. From a persecutor of the church, he became a champion of the church of Christ. I want you to remember this. We might be a product of our past, but we are not a prisoner of our past. We can choose to be free. Change starts with a choice. For those of you who have not yet accepted the Lord, we are inviting you to come forward to accept the Lord now. Don't have that regret in your life. While you have the opportunity to change, change starts now. Please stand up for the invitation song.